so this is going to continue on in terms of this lecture here. All right, so classification. We've got what's called systematics. And systematics, it is the study of ordering, putting everything in the world into some kind of order, groupings, branchings, so that we can see how things are evolutionary, evolutionarily related. If you're somebody who likes organization and order, this is a very interesting field. This field has really exploded because of our ability to sequence DNA and look at the sequences of DNA and see how things are related, see how organisms are related. Systematics is classification of organisms, organization of organisms, and it shows and all of this is based on how things are related over long periods of time or evolutionary time. So it's pretty fascinating. As I mentioned, they'll use things like DNA, but it could be that they use like RNA, could be they look at protein sequences. This is a, a very other interesting part of the field is that they're starting to use immunology, the way that our immune system work, because we can see even in the world now, um, as you hear the, probably the bubbling up of talk of the avian flu. Yeah. Yeah, and how that can kind of cross species barriers and what affects one species. Usually we have, and we'll talk about this when we get into the, um, the viruses and bacteria, is usually living things, whatever affects them, is very specific to a species. And also, not only a species, but maybe like what particular cells, tissues, or organs are affected. But now we're seeing in the world that sometimes they call it jumps the species barrier. And so avian flu, for example, is very dangerous to jump the species barrier because humans have approximately like a 46 chance of 46 percent chance of survival of of what if you contract the avian flu of living well talk about a pandemic that is like scary that's going to be the pandemic like idea that is really scary so it, within within systematics there is the field of taxonomy Taxonomy uses words to classify organisms. So we give organisms a name, like Homo sapiens, Australopithecus afarensis, Homo neanderthalensis. And then we also can group into other kind of hierarchical groups, like domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. And we can go from like these really big groupings where everything Every living thing in the world belongs to one of three groups, one of three domains. And then you start to go from, okay, we're gonna put you into one of these three, and then from those, I'm gonna put you into a smaller grouping, a smaller grouping, smaller grouping, till we get to a very specific grouping or the species grouping. The big deal is naming. All of these hierarchical groups have names. And so we use words to start to benefit us in terms of where does everything belong. Phylogeny is where systematics leads us next. And so when we're talking about phylogeny, we're looking at not only groupings, but those groupings are based on evolutionary relationships. Common ancestor. These two groups share a common ancestor. These groups share a common ancestor. And so we can describe relationships using phylogeny as to where an organism exists in regard to another group. So when we talk about a common ancestor between a group or many groups, they have a shared ancestry. And that shared ancestry may show how similar or from the shared ancestry, like 
like all of the vertebrates, we talked about there's a common ancestor and then they started to diverge or show divergent evolution from that common ancestor based on how their limbs were favored in specific environments. And so we're looking at that, what we call again, divergent evolution, going away from a shared ancestry with a common ancestor. That's phylogeny. Phylogeny helps us to produce a drawing system where we can visually see how are things related and where is that common ancestor at? And it becomes what we know of like a tree with branches on it. So we call those phylogenetic trees. And again, where you have that branch shows a common ancestor. And then where they start to move into different environments based on the structures, the features that are best suited to the specific environment that they have gone to live in. So this shows us a bit of natural selection within the tree. Remember that when we're talking about like humans, like the branch that goes from humans to the rest of the primates, that those two branches, they come from a common ancestor. And that tells us that humans did not evolve from monkeys or other primates or vice versa, that gorillas did not evolve from humans, but they evolved from a branch, a common ancestor. They have a shared ancestry, but they did not evolve one from the other. And that's like the, one of the big misconceptions of evolution, right? A lot of people will say, I don't believe in evolution because we're not monkeys. It's like, you're correct in that we're not monkeys. We have a common ancestor. So that's important to know in terms of what we call a phylogenetic tree. You can see a little example of a phylogenetic tree that we will get into in just a minute. Okay, so evolutionary relationships, the more what we call clades. Clade is just a more scientific word for group. The more groups that two organisms share, the more closely they share a common ancestor and show their specific, the more groups show these very close evolutionary relationships. So Careless Linnaeus was a scientist who started to come up with this naming system. Uh, Carolus Linnaeus went by Carl von Linné, and also, now I can't remember, he has another name he went by. So perhaps because he had so many different names that he thought, well, this is hard if you have the, a bunch of different names for the same organism that, you know, if you like go to a, let's say you go to a big party and this group of friends calls you this and this group of friends call you this, but your family calls you this and the people at work call you this, right? And so you're in a room with people who call you four different things. And then they start to reset, like they start talking to each other and then they realize they're talking about you and they don't know that because you have different names oh, for yeah. different groups, right? Yeah. And so that's like the idea, what Carl von Linné thought, how can we make this easy and what we call the common name for a species could be a variety of different things. And just like every species has one name. And so we can get to that, we have kind of that difference between the scientific name and then the common name. And this is the Linnaean system that Carl von Linné, Carolus Linnaeus came up with. Okay, so it also helps us to narrow down evolutionarily. Is that page one? Uh -oh. oh, here, yeah, the common ancestor, sorry. Um, it helps us to kind of narrow down the categories that something exists in. And so his system too has a lot of, again, order to it and organization. And his system kind of works like if you, let's say you walk in a Target and you need to get Band-Aids. And so when you walk in a Target, imagine if in Target that when boxes came off trucks, people just put them wherever a shelf was empty. 
and everything was just mixed together in there. And you walked in and you were like, you know how big a target is. You walked in and you just had to find band-aids on some shelf somewhere, wherever the person who unloaded the truck found a spot to put it in. Would that waste a ton of time, right? So Target, you walk in and you can look up and you can see like clothes and you can see pharmacy and healthcare and beauty items. And so you've got it, it's all organized for you on the ceilings. And so you're like, oh, I need to go to the pharmacy section where there would be like first aid. So you go walk over there and on the end of the aisles, it tells you what is in each aisle. And so you can walk down the aisle and see, oh, first aid is in this aisle. You walk down the aisle and then there's little things sticking out that say band-aids. And so within an aisle even, it kind of narrows you down quickly to finding what you need to find. And that is Carolus Linnaeus' idea, is let's get everything narrowed down, ordered, and organized. So his organization system starts with large groupings. Everything falls into one of three groups. Everything falls into one of three domains. These are the, what we call most inclusive. Inclusive means includes. They include the most organisms. So either you are a bacteria, an archaea, or a eukarya. And so like if we're talking about us, for example, because our cells have a nucleus, we fall into the eukarya domain. So now between those three, we fall into there. But are there like millions of other eukaryans? Yeah, totally. And so now we've got a lot of organisms within this grouping. Then we go to kingdom, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, genus. Oh, sorry, family, genus, species, I missed family. And so then we get to what we call the scientific name or the genus and species name, which for humans we are Homo sapiens. Homo is our genus and sapiens is our species name. The smallest group, the species name, the word specific comes from there because the species is very specific to one group. And what we learned in evolution was that one group is reproductively isolated. It can only mate with itself. So when we get to the naming, the genus, but specifically the species can only mate by itself. It is very inclusive. It only includes one specific kind of organism. So again, let the words work for you in biology. Sometimes you get a little clue in there. This is one of my favorite animals, organisms ever. Its scientific name is Chilinius undulatus. This magnificent fish is about this big. It has neon blue and green with this crazy amazing, amazing patterns on it. It has a big hump above its big eyes. It has a few little teeth that come and stick out. It makes it look kind of dopey with a big mouth. This one here of this species is called the super male. The super male, there's only one in every community or group of these species, I should say one population. So if you go to a coral reef and there's just like this reef area about the, bit, the size of this room, there would be one super male, but then there would also be other males who are smaller and kind of like beige in color. And then the females who are a little bit bigger than the males, the other males who aren't very brightly colored either. And there's only one of him, or should I say them. The super male, when the super male dies, as it's dying, it gives off, they believe, some kind of like pheromone or chemicals. And those chemicals are received by the largest female in the population and she starts to change 
her, I should say, I shouldn't say she, but they start to change their internal physiology to become female to male. And she, they, start to grow in size, change colors, and they become the new super male. Females, yeah, it's kind of confusing. Females want to mate with the super male. So her girlfriends that she hung out with, that they had a nice friendly relationship, suddenly are like, they're hot. And they're going to try and mate with them. So within the species, they have the ability to be both male and female, but only a few females actually do become both. Pretty cool, right? Okay, so let's talk about the binomial. Bi means two. Nomenclature, name. It's a two word system of naming the genus and the species name, Chilinius undulatus. There's your binomial nomenclature. So again, back to Carl von Linné, Carolus Linnaeus, and this kind of very specific orderly system. So let's say that I call this, I'm like, oh, I saw, I come up from diving with a bunch of divers, I'm like, oh my gosh, I saw the humphead brass. And somebody else says, I saw a Napoleon brass. And then somebody else says, I saw an Ipis Ipis. And somebody else says, I saw the double-headed Maori brass. We're all talking about the same thing. And if each of us just said, and we might get to the point where we figure out, like, like we go into a book that has all the fish species in there, or animal species on a reef, and we go in there, and I'm like, yeah, it was the hugest one I've ever seen. And then they start going, that's what I saw, but you called it something different. And then I go, oh yeah, because the scientific name is Chilinius undulatus. And then you look, usually it'll have a listing of all the common names, and sometimes it doesn't even include in those scientific books, it doesn't even include every common name, because like, for example, maybe in Papua New Guinea, this is a name that only they use, and it's not used worldwide, so it never makes it into a guidebook. So that scientific name is really important. If you're an explorer and you discover a new species, you get to choose the name. How would you know to discover a new species? Well, you go to like databases and see what's out there. Um, it's a lot more efficient now because like for example, the protein cytochrome C. Almost every species on the planet has this protein. So you might go to a cytochrome C database and put in, you might sequence that, the cytochrome C for the species that you found, and then you see if it matches anybody else's. So you might start there. And if there's no match, and then you go to a few other databases until you figure out like, nothing's matching up with what I found here. And so then, get to go uh, into the process of naming it. Yeah, so that's a really good question. So the cytochrome C, do all members of a specific um, species, do they have the same sequence in their cytochrome yes. C? Yes, uh, not necessarily, because there still might be mutations. Like, like mutations for like uh, one version or a, a few different alleles of it. Mm -hmm. So like, I'm just throwing this like off the top of my head as an example, right? Perhaps in human, there's four different versions of it. And so then there might be, there will be mutations to code for those four different versions, but for the majority of it, it is the same. Okay. The wheel will code for just a different, little different thing. Okay. Um, it's interesting, cytochrome C has also given us the idea, and then even prokaryotic cells, single cell organisms that are uh, no nucleus, they have no nucleus, that include the archaea and the bacteria domains, even they have cytochrome C, which gives us the idea of thinking about that tree is that we all come from a common ancestor because there are sequences in our DNA, our RNA, our proteins that show us that there are similarities across all of the domains. So pretty fascinating. 
lot of times when people say, well, I don't think we evolved from uh, prokaryotes, and, but it gives us a lot of evidence that we probably did, hypothetically did. Okay, so again, Taro, the scientific name is the genus <coughs> and the species name, so we're gonna look at what does that mean? So even if like, let's say you go into pharmacolo pharmacological research um, and you're studying antibiotics in regard to specific kinds of bacteria infections, you might discover a new species of bacteria. So there's always room kind of in the world. It's not just like you're somebody who's going through the rainforest and hiking and looking for new species. There are species everywhere. And so you perhaps could come across one. Or if you're working in a, like an emergency room department or you're a surgeon, you might come across something new as well, like a new fungus or a new protist or a new bacteria that affects humans. So in my example, Chilinius is the genus name and Angelatus is the species name. I want you to recognize two things about this. One is, is that the genus name is capitalized, but the species name is not. And when I type a scientific name, I do it in italics. So those are kind of key things about writing a, a scientific name. All right, so here's four other scientific names. Chelonia mitis, Calicibus malic, Cardinalis, Cardinalis, and Escherichia coli, which you worked with the common name E. coli, which is just shortened Escherichia coli. Notice again, the Genus names are capitalized, the species names are lowercase. Everything's written in italics. And so when we look at just some one of each of the common names, Chelonia mitis is the green sea turtle, Calicibus malic is the red titi monkey, Cardinalis cardinalis is the northern cardinal, the one that we ate, the red one, the male that we see that's red, and the female is like brown. brown. Yeah, brown, light brown, real bland. And the E. coli again, we just call it E period coli. So remember again, the genus name of a species name is capitalized. If you're typing, you'll do it in italics. If you're writing by hand, you underline. So I know like it was grading some of the lab 21s getting through them. And um, some of the scientific names, you all like did capitals for both, and I just corrected it, but I didn't take off points. So you haven't been introduced to this concept yet. But what I would like to see going forward, if you're ever writing about a species, is that you capitalize the genus, lowercase the species, and then in your, like if you're doing it in lab, you're gonna underline that name. Oh, is that why, um, was there an error somewhere that said to underline the, I think on the one where we had to do like the monk, the different skulls, mm -hmm. I think it said to underline. Yeah, because there's, there's directions to read, but um, only a few people actually did that. <laughs> okay, biodiversity. So biodiversity, the term, a lot of times people just think it's the number of species, but it's not just that. It also is the complexity or the reliance among species on one another. Can you survive on your own as a species with no interaction with any other species? Okay, what are a couple interactions? What are some interactions that we absolutely rely on for our survival? Eating other people. Which one? Eating other people. Eating, yes. Great, Jake. Like eating. We eat other species. <laughs> right? Breathing. We rely on photosynthesizers, taking in oxygen, breathing out carbon dioxide. So just those little things. We have what's called a microbiome that exists a whole ecosystem. We are an ecosystem. 
There's a whole bunch of organisms that live in and on us, and we rely on them for our survival. That's crazy. Yeah. And microbiome is another field of research that is so cool. Like, if you go into bioengineering, for example, UAC has a really great program, master's program. Um, what we are learning is that the species that you have inside of you and on you determine whether you are healthy or not healthy. Your microbiome will change depending on who you live with in your own home. What? Yeah, so if you get a new roommate and they have really bad habits, if they have bad habits, like they bake and they drink a lot and they eat fast food all the time, they don't exercise, their microbiome is not gonna be as healthy and if you're somebody who does the opposite of those things, they're gonna actually start to negatively impact you and you're going to start to positively impact them. So you start to meet closer in the middle, which is like, mm, you gotta think about who you surround yourself with. They also, there's a whole new field of research, of medical research, that people are looking into of how your microbiome affects the diseases that you have. And genetics. is it not only genetics, but also environment? And so we're looking at, of course, we know, right, your genetics will determine, like for example, I know because my father has always had high cholesterol, I have a tendency to have higher cholesterol, just normally. And even when I played basketball, and even when I was like working out a lot, my cholesterol still, like working out lower tends to lower your cholesterol, it still was like kind of borderline there. So as much as I could do, so one of the other, like for many reasons, I'm a vegetarian for the most part. Once in a while I have like sushi, um, that, eating a high vegetable diet tends to lower cholesterol. I know like eating oatmeal every day will really have a good effect on your cholesterol. So there's things that I do to keep my cholesterol down, but also the environment that I'm in will influence my having high cholesterol or not just based on my microbiome too. We'll talk a lot, like a number of times throughout the semester about this. Having pets will change your microbiome. Dogs have been shown to positively impact your microbiome. Whoa. Yep, so like let that dog lick your face. I don't know, well, I don't know if that's it. I'll pet <laughs> I don't know if that's the exact thing but, or how that typically works, but there's research to show that your microbiome is enhanced by having a dog. What about a cat? Cats, the research is still out on them. So it's kind of interesting. I'm a snake and a mantis, so who knows? Yeah, right, I know, right, right, exactly. I got to see right. if my frogs are good for me. Yeah. I think because like dogs are kind of the more popular pet, right? Um, snakes that there's are so been underrated. a lot of research on them. People need to get more snakes. They're underrated. I just saw some snakes. reptile show thing was going to go on. I don't know when it was. But They're going to Juliet soon. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I, bought, I, bought my, <laughs> I bought my mantis at, uh, at one of the big reptile expos like just last summer. Over. So oh, yeah, she, she's still a baby, but yeah, she, yeah. They're cool. Yeah. There's an ARBC in one. Yeah, if you're interested, get to talk to your classmates. If you want some pets other than a dog or a cat, there's cool stuff out there. Word. I've owned a lot of weird stuff, so come to me if you want some advice on weird, <laughs> weird, weird cool pets. Cool. I've never owned a cat or a dog before, but I've owned so many other different stuff. Like, I've, I've owned some wild stuff. Cool. <laughs> That's so cool. Estimated biodiversity, every year, every year, look at the amount of new species that are discovered. So there's a lot of research going on in the world. And again, it's not just animals. There's a lot of prokaryotes that are being discovered. Uh, mostly though, insects, just so many, so many insects in the rainforest that people are discovering. Okay, how many species are out there in the world right now? Well, uh, who knows, like 1.5 million identified? How many species actually exist? I mean, some scientists will think there's like seven to 10 million, and then other people think well, there's probably like 100 million or a trillion, a lot. There's a lot of species out there. Uh, we certainly, as we talked about last unit, 
we are acting as agents of natural selection on every species on the planet. So how are these faring? You know, we're discovering and filling, and so there's a lot going on. All right, so a little bit about the identified uh, biodiversity. Check these statistics out. So prokaryotes. Prokaryotes have the most weight of any groupings on the planet. So there's more prokaryotes in weight than there are humans, than there are animals, than there are the whole eukarya domain. But we know a lot more about the eukarya domain than we do the bacteria and archaeans. And let's think about why. Okay, so I want you all to think like if you, you got a new phone and you want to put a new wallpaper on that phone and someone said you have to choose an organism to put there. Conjure your mind. Think about what organism you would put. How many of you thought, oh, this bacteria is so cute. I'm going to put this bacteria on there. Anybody thinking about a really cute bacteria species? Yeah? So that's a protist. So then, so yeah, like the water bear is like kind of a new narwhal, unicorn, or whatever. Um, uh, did most of you think about an animal? Yeah, so worry. That's a bird, so. Flower? Anything outside of animal and flower? Yeah, I don't know, plant. Like my background is literally like lichen from the tree. Cool. Okay. Fungus and uh, some kind of photosynthetic organism. Yeah. What is insects again? Yeah, insects and animal. Yeah. So we are. We just. We think about animals with a little bit more endearment because why? They have eyes and a face like ours, <laughs> right? And when those babies, they're so cute. <laughs> so we're just a little more like endeared to them because they kind of look like us, but probably a little bit cuter in a lot of ways. And the way they act is cute when they do things that are human-like, but not quite like a human would do. You're like, oh, that's so cute, <laughs> right? So plants, maybe some of you plants and fungi, maybe thought like a beautiful flower or a beautiful fungus growing on a tree. There but, are some glow-in-the-dark fungi. Oh, yeah. Really cool. I mean, fungi, we'll get to fungi. But prokaryotes, we're just not like as endeared to them. So that's one thing, is that people go into fields where they try and discover animals. The other thing is that it's really hard to discover a new bacterium. When you all worked with E. coli a couple weeks ago, you had to, now if you had to actually like, grow up the e. coli and pour the plates. So that was all done for you. If you had to like do that process of getting the auger, that gooey stuff ready in the plate, and then also get the E. coli dust and then put it in a broth and make that what you kind of dipped into and swiped. So that's a big process that takes time. And then you have to you know swab them and then it takes a couple days before you see any growth. And once you see growth, that growth pattern categorizes into like, okay, so it's this kind of bacteria. It looks like this kind of bacteria, but then you have to do other things like stain the bacteria. So then you have to take a little bit and you make a smear on a slide and you stain it with colors. And then that may start to narrow it down. And you're like, okay, I think it's a gram positive bacteria. And then from there, you also have to genetically sequence it. How many of you have like a sequencing machine at home? I'm gonna guess nobody, and if you do, uh, then you'd have to genetically sequence it, and then you'd have to compare the sequence among other organisms, and so it just, it's a lot harder to work with. Now, where do you go and like hunt for them? Let's say you're going with some rainforest exploration, somebody who is looking for insects, and you're like, I'm gonna tag along because I'm gonna take a lot of swabs and samples because I'm interested in finding new archaeans. Well, then you have to like bring all of this medium or like broth and things that you're gonna take swabs and put the samples in containers. And, and so it's a, a lot like bigger of a process too for collection. So we just like, animals are easier to identify. We're more endeared to them. We just think there's a 
more accessible, all the things I just talked about. All right, so here's a phylogenetic tree of life. This generically includes everything. There are three domains, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Check this out. So we believe, hypothetically, that all living things came from a common ancestor that was prokaryotic. So see that the archaea and bacterial domains, they start here at the base of the tree. That means that they have a common ancestor with one another. Anytime you see a V, it means that there was a common ancestor there. The eukarya, of which we belong to within the animal kingdom, we have a common ancestor with archaea, the archaea domain. So we have a common ancestor with this group of prokaryotic cells. And then you see this branching grows, and you have here a few branches that encompass the protists group, the plants, the fungi, and the animals. And it looks like, you know, at the tip here, the two youngest eukarya groups are the fungi and the animals. Protists would include seaweed, the photosynthesizers that lived in water, and so they're the, the oldest of the eukaryans. Plants are believed to have evolved green, uh, from green seaweed. So you have plants coming off with a common ancestor with a, one of the protist branches. So remember that wherever you have a V, you have an evolutionary relationship where they have a common ancestor. So in these, if I asked you, who does fungi have a common ancestor with, would you have one or two answers there? Yeah, fungi have a common ancestor with plants, but also with animals. If I said, who do animals have a common ancestor with, who would it be? Yeah, animals have a common ancestor with fungi. So all of these little branches here show common ancestry. Every time you have a branch coming off of a larger branch and then you have that V, those Vs show the common ancestry. Sometimes call it the tree of life or the web of life. So, like, given that you know, uh, everything has like the microbiome, would it be safe to assume that if you did find a new animal species, they would more than likely have bacteria that weren't discovered? I think that's a very good assumption, a good hypothesis. Yeah, yeah. So then that could open up a whole new discovery of many, many species. Yeah, very smart. Ever heard of? Muga, last universal common ancestor? No. It's like a, it's, it's basically what it is. It's like the hypothetical like species this. that every, all living things today have a common ancestor. Okay. With. So yeah. this would be Muga down, probably down here. Right? Yeah. Okay. All right, so remember, three domain system. Archaea, some people call it archaea, however you want to say it. Prokaryotic cells. Pro means before, periodic means, means nucleus. I believe I mentioned this in the evolution lecture, the history of life. Pro before, periodic nucleus. So that means it, these evolved before organisms with a nucleus. They evolved before the U era. U means true, era, nucleus. Bacteria are also prokaryotic. They also evolved before those with the nucleus evolved. And our third domain are the eukarya. U, E-U, E-U is U. U means true. True nucleus. True U, periodic nucleus. All right, so here's the other weird thing is that, again, because we're just like more endeared and it's easier to work with animals 
and also the protists and the fungi and the plants, is that the eukarya have kingdoms, but we don't have kingdoms under archaea and bacteria. So huge fields of research here to begin figuring out where they all fit on tree. Lots of cool stuff that you could do to add kingdoms to these. So just because there are no kingdoms doesn't mean there won't be in the future. Again, here's Luca down here somewhere. And then you have the bacteria and the archaea branches, and then eventually the eukarya branch comes off the archaea branch. No nucleus, prokaryotic cells, no nucleus. Eukarya, right there in the domain name, it tells you that everybody in here have cells that have a nucleus. Here's just like another tree version of living things. These are all of the eukarya. The protists group, all of the protists are here and above. The protists are generally smaller in size, and we'll get to a lot of details about them. We'll go through each of these different groupings. But the protists, you can see that there's a lot of study and branching on them. There's the plantae. Uh, there's a few, like amoebozoa, that were in the protist groups, but they think they might be their own, so they might become their own individual kingdom. Um, so we're not really sure. This is like, even in the last, I'd say, 10 years, there's been a lot of changing of all of these groups from being all in a protist group to having their own kingdoms now. So this is always evolving as well. Fungi, animals. So look at animals. Even though animals are named most, this is only the eukaryons. Animals, we have the most information on, yet there's a lot of other species out there. All right, so a little bit about eukarya. Eukarya, all the cells have a nucleus. They're called eukaryotes. Eukaryote is a noun. Eukaryotic is an adjective. So I could say all of our cells are eukaryotes. That's a noun. Or I could say all of our cells are eukaryotic cells. I would be describing the cells as having a nucleus. So just knowing that oftentimes students will have a question like, what's the difference between the two? Like one's an adjective and one's a noun. That's it. All right, and then we have all these. Again, here's just that other one on the side to show you that going to the common ancestor of all the eukaryotes down here. All right, so let's talk 